Welcome to the video where we count down the 10 smallest towns in Texas from the 10th smallest incorporated town to the very smallest incorporated town. And, and I say incorporated because that's key. Unincorporated towns aren't on this list. So if you're looking for your town and you wonder why it's not here, it's probably because it's not incorporated. So all these towns have a form of government. They have a, a mayor of some sort or a city council and they are officially towns that are counted in the U.S. Census population figures. Should be an interesting trip, so let's get started with number 10. We start our trip in Putnam, Texas, population 63. And uh, Putnam is a, a typical town that was larger and it has over time gotten smaller and smaller. And I'm inside the Putnam post office. There's no one here. Uh, it's just kind of one of those small towns where the you come in and get your mail or you, or you mail something out and there's uh, not always someone at the post office. Um, but Putnam was a railroad town. It's actually the way it's set up. The railroad kind of splits the town in two. I-20 is in the middle as well. So they put that, you know, paralleling the railroad eventually. And uh, Putnam, um, they started as a, a place that had some mineral springs and the town promoters thought it could become a, a big town to, to promote those kind of like healing springs. But it was, I guess it was too close to mineral wells, which is, not too far from here and uh, it never really was able to take off. They did discover oil and there was a uh, fruit, uh, fruit, you know, agriculture here. And, um, and so that helped the town grow. There were, there was at, at one time like 600 people that lived here and then it has dwindled over time. It's basically a ghost town in terms of the, you know, it's lost like 90% of the population and as you go around, there are a lot of old abandoned buildings. Um, if, you, if you like that kind of stuff, it's certainly a place to explore on both sides of the railroad track. So um, there's, there's also a downtown that has a lot of old buildings as well. A couple businesses, there's a cafe that was open, uh, but not too much going on, but a terrific way to start the countdown here at number 10. This is a pretty remarkable place. Uh, it was much larger, over a thousand people in uh, the early 1900s. 
and and now it's down to 61. And you can see when you go around this town, uh, there's so many, you know, it's so big. It's, you can see there used to be a lot of people here. And, you know, it's unfortunate what it has become. It's basically a ghost town, although obviously there are people still living here. There are people, you know, driving around, uh, working around the area. But it is so many abandoned places like the school behind me, which I'm going to show you a little bit of inside there. But uh, yeah, it's, I'll give you a perspective with the drone to give you an idea how big it is. And, and, uh, but yeah, certainly sad state of affairs for what it is when you drive around. But there's a lot of beautiful old buildings. And uh, for a guy like me, really enjoy seeing a place like this and thinking about what it used to be in its heyday when it was a major uh, stop on the railroad for uh, cattle shipping. And like I said, it had over a thousand people. The Great Depression uh, hurt it significantly and, and it started to dwindle. And then a couple decades ago, there was a tornado that ripped through here and took out a lot of the old buildings. I, I think even kind of right along the railroad, we're, we're a few blocks from the railroad right here, but right along the railroad, I think is where kind of the main street was. And there's, there's just kind of some rubble and um, a few older buildings still there, but we'll take a look at it. Lakeview has had kind of an interesting history and it's a very interesting place to visit. Um, just w my initial impressions when I got here, I drove down the main street and it's amazing how many old buildings are still here and um, obviously it's very windy <laughs> out here. You can hear the, uh, they got a little chime up there. I'm in front of the old school and, but, but yeah, just amazing driving down that main street and so many old abandoned buildings down there that haven't been demolished and that's always great you know for a guy like me to find because I like that kind of stuff and shows the history of the town but the town was um, it's been a survivor even though it's obviously getting much smaller and down to 60 people in the latest census 
and but it was originally in a different location and they put it in the look in that location because that's where the railroad was and then I, I don't know if, if maybe it wasn't great place for agriculture or something but um, they decided to the, the people who started that decided to move away or sell their land and then uh, someone who stayed back took over the post office and and kind of the ownership of the town and they moved it uh, to another location which ended up being good for the growth it it, it was uh, I've read it's as many as a thousand people the early estimates of population show it only in the 300 to 400 range but they said before that time kind of before the Great Depression there was almost a thousand people that lived here and then the Great Depression hit and then there were a series of fires as well kind of during that time that that was that was uh, difficult to deal with and and then over time it just got smaller and smaller and it is very remote it is it is a long kind of lonely road to get here um, but you can see the 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 town is a mixture of these old abandoned buildings and old houses so you can see people still live here the houses are kind of worn out looking and actually some places you can't really tell if it's an abandoned house or somebody might live there because I think the wind and the weather and just it has beaten down uh, this place but there's business here there's uh, I mean farming you walk around you see cotton balls everywhere that have the wind has blown them throughout the town uh, but there's a restaurant and there's there's business happening it's a weekday and there's people around so still a little life left in Lakeview Texas Dayton Lakes uh, is a very strange one. I'm not sure uh, what to make of this one. I don't know much about it. Not a whole lot of information online, um, except for it's a new town. It was, it was uh, incorporated in 1985. Originally, this area was known as Dayton Lake Estates. There's a town called Dayton, not far away, and there's, I think, lakes around here. Um, and uh, they wanted, to, the people here wanted to incorporate into their own town. So in 1985, they voted, they petitioned the county, and they um, created a town. Although you drive around, and it's very strange. It's, a, it's, it's rained here, obviously, recently, so it's a, not very many paved roads. It's kind of way back. You, you go off the main road and drive for a few miles, and, um, and you're kind of in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and the roads are, like I said, muddy and um, it's strange and it it feels like uh, you know just kind of out here in a quiet place it is very pretty um, but it's I don't know what to make of it population has when they incorporated it was almost a couple hundred people and it's it's shrunk every census down um, so I don't know I'll give you a little bit of idea what's here 
but uh, maybe other people know a little bit more about Dayton Lakes than I can find. I'm in a very bright and sunny Spofford, Texas. I believe that's how you say it, Spofford. And uh, I'm standing here on the railroad tracks or near the railroad tracks because this is how the community started. The uh, 1882, the railroad came through here and a couple years later, the uh, town started. And it uh, was a pretty popular stop along the railroad here. And population grew to about 400. The first recorded populations um, I could find was in the 1950s or so and it was just under that and then it's dwindled uh, since then actually it went down into the double digits about 1960 and has been there went up a little bit in 2010 and then back down to what it is today um, so it's a very quiet community you can hear all the dogs barking obviously they've been chasing me around as I've been exploring and uh, and uh, but it's, it's very peaceful it's Kind of unusual because it's a big area uh, when you drive around it's hard to find some things there's a few remnants of of old buildings but there's not too many but most of them are here along the railroad tracks Welcome to the town of Draper, Texas, aka Corral City, and kind of an interesting little town, not a traditional old town. Uh, it is noisy. We are right next to uh, Highway 35. We're just a few miles north of the Texas Motor Speedway here near uh, Fort Worth, and so if, you're, if you know where that, at, where that is, then you'll know where I'm kind of standing right now. Uh, but interesting history. So in 1973, the Helton family started this town to get around the liquor laws. You hear about that some in, in Texas. There's a dry county, so they wanted to sell alcohol. So they incorporated uh, 20 acres of land and they made it a town, called it Corral City. And you can imagine in 1973, this area wasn't built up like it is now. Now it's towns and things all you know, houses and things that are all kind of butting up against each other. But back then it was, uh, you know, a place to stop and get alcohol and probably convenience store and things like that as well. 
So uh, in the 1990s, the Heltons sold the property and it became kind of a, a ghost town. And so the man, a man named Draper became the mayor and in 2016 changed the name to Draper, Texas. And uh, it, it, on maps, it still says Corral City because obviously, I mean, there's buildings that say Corral City here. So it's known as that, even though I think technically the name is Draper now. If you type in Draper, it'll take you to Corral City. So uh, kind of interesting, you know, how that works out. But it's it's a interesting place because it has a RV, a big RV park where there's a lot of RVs and, um, you know, people that are here. The population is only 33, so I don't know where the 33 people live, if some of them maybe are permanent residents in the RV park, uh, because it looks like there's just land besides the RV park. And then there's a big uh, convenience store right here next to me uh, called the Corral City Market. So there's also a corral <laughs> right next to it. So it's it's just a weird, you know, Texas has some odd things. And so there's a highway with a corral next to it with Corral City. Very interesting, strange, and exactly what you would probably expect from Texas. Ibanez, Texas uh, was the smallest town in the 2010 census and has grown slightly uh, since then and others have gotten smaller so that's why it is where it is on the list now. Uh, this is a kind of crazy one. You'll see a pattern developing of these towns that wanted to sell alcohol and that's why they incorporate as towns and this is this is uh, one of those and uh, Texas was a, dry, was a dry state, was a dry state, I guess, and each municipality or county is, is able to create their own laws that way. And so this was in the 1970s or 80s, they incorporated this small piece of land and started a uh, liquor store, convenience store, which is still here. I actually spoke to the gentleman running it and said that I could explore a little bit. It's, it's uh, unbelievable. It has a uh, kind of an oblong shaped road that goes around and there are so many abandoned houses the the population was you know in the 80s when it kind of started and now it's down in the you know 20s and it seems like there's probably 50 buildings or houses they're all houses and a handful of them uh, have anyone remaining most of them are just abandoned and so I don't know what what happened or why that was the case but it's it's strange um, and it's uh, a little eerie to walk around and check this out, but the, the gentleman at the store was very friendly, and um, you know, so I thought definitely was glad that I came here. This is definitely a unique experience in finding the smallest towns in Texas.
This next town of Quintana is certainly different than all the other towns, mainly because we are right here next to, uh, we're on the beach next to the Gulf of Mexico. And it, it's the one town that's not inland on this whole list. And it has a very unique history. It was originally in the 1820s, Mexico gained its independence from Spain and won this piece of land. And so this was uh, Mexican owned for a long time and it was a strategic area obviously a port that was good to have uh, control of they had a fort here and then you hear you're gonna hear some of those noises <laughs> as we're on the beach here but uh, but then Stephen F Austin led a group of people who uh, took over this land um, because it was such a valuable area and this they, they took over this land thinking that it could become a major port like Houston or Galveston, which are just you know north of here, and it never happened. Uh, there, there was growth. There was um, a time where it, it grew to several hundred people, and um, but for one reason or another, uh, it just never took off as the major port like those other cities did. They had some good ideas. They created uh, what was called jetties uh, here to kind of uh, help with fishing and to help get ships into the port um, and it, this became a big uh, fishing village and still is actually. Around 1900 there was a big hurricane that wiped out much of the, much of the town and they had to rebuild. Uh, they did and it kind of came back again and then the depression hit and then they uh, some chemical and oil companies bought some of this land to this and to this day you can see them it's right next to uh, the town that's considered Quintana and you can see these big factories right over here right next to the road very very you know beautiful area I'm sure and it would be a cool place to visit it's it's remote to get to um, you know it's it's not a convenient stop off the expressway so you do have to take a little bit of a detour but I imagine in the summertime when the sun's out the beach is full of families and and uh, good times are had by all pretty wild but I'm gonna take it as far as I can we'll see how far I can go That was a pretty sketchy walk. Uh, it's not bad here at the end. It's, the rocks are more protected and kind of up around you, but through the middle there, that was, I don't know if it's a bad day or normally it's just choppy, but uh, yeah, it's a, uh, that was, I've been in a, some pretty creepy places 
throughout the series of making these videos and uh, my heart was racing a little bit walking down that because it's just a I don't know it's a good mile with waves crashing on both sides of you And now we have reach number two on the list with Impact, Texas, population 22. And this is another one of those towns that was created to get around the uh, liquor laws in the you know mid-1900s. Um, this one was in the early 1960s, was, was uh, bought and incorporated right here on the outskirts of Abilene. And this was um, actually when they tried to incorporate this town, the city of Abilene, because it was so close and there were a lot of people that didn't want liquor sold here, um, they fought it. And it actually went all the way to the Texas Supreme Court before the town of Impact won and was able to incorporate. And then they, as a town, voted to uh, make it legal to sell alcohol and opened a store here. It was very successful and very profitable. And with that money, the city was able to pave roads and um, have some structure, you know, to the town before it was just a plot of land where there was, a, you know, a store and, and some houses. The original uh, person that had the idea, his name was Dallas Perkins, and he owned a, a store called Pinkies that had a big pink elephant in the front. In 1978, the county narrowly voted to allow liquor sales here and so once that happened uh, the need for impact uh, the you know the liquor selling here was was not needed anymore uh, it was never a big community uh, I think 61 has been the most that it's had and it's gotten smaller down to what it is 22 today there's really not much here there's uh, the intersection is is barren basically and and there is foundations of a building. I'm assuming that was probably the, the main store because it's right here. It's a, it's a very small area of land, just a couple streets. And so there's that. There's a, a pretty cool looking old oil uh, structure there. And within the city limits, there is a distribution company. So there is a business here that's it's behind a you know private driveway. Uh, so... Um, so there is something here and the fact that we are basically a suburb here of Abilene, you could see that someday, I imagine if Abilene grows, it will grow out to here and maybe this could become a pretty valuable place. We have made it to the number one spot, Mustang, Texas, and population zero. And this is a wild and kind of crazy story. And I'm in the vehicle because it's right basically on a busy and noisy highway uh, 45 here in Texas. It's an unusual story, unusual history, and why it has zero, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a mystery, but here's kind of the history of the town. So this county was a dry county, Navarro County. And in 1973, uh, there were some people that wanted to start a town so they could sell alcohol here. And since you couldn't do it anywhere else, it kind of be, it, it would become a center of a place where people could come buy alcohol. So in 1973, a group of people led by a William McKee incorporated the town of Mustang 
and it and they opened a business here and uh, probably a convenience store and, and a place to sell alcohol. And they did that for, until about in the 1990s where other places were able to start selling alcohol as well. So it lost its status as kind of the place in this area to sell alcohol. And by the end of the 1990s, it had its highest population of 47. And then from there, it's, it's gone down, uh, but not for typical reasons. So in 2005, the owner of the town, basically, William McKee, who started the town, uh, was gonna sell his sell the property to a Tommy Sinclair uh, for something like $600,000. And he had a club, which is actually still here, not open anymore, he had a club on the property. And so it was gonna kind of become his town. The transaction didn't get completed and Mr. McKee passed away before that could happen. So his wife took over uh, kind of the responsibility of the town, but Tommy Sinclair sued because he was, you know, thinking he should have ownership of the property. And amidst all this, uh, about a year later, uh, the city of Angus, which is basically right next to it here, was going to shut off the water because no, the town had not paid their water bill. So uh, the wife of Mr. McKee paid the water bill herself. So they were the residents that were here were able to have water. So then in 2007 or 2008, there were two different parties that thought they should own this property. And so they had two separate elections to elect like a council. And, and, and within days, they both had elections. And after they had their election results, which were literally a handful of votes, because there weren't that many people here, there were a dozen people here or so, uh, and after those election results, they both claimed legitimacy of the government of Mustang. But another twist, one year later in 2009, Tommy Sinclair, who ran that club right there, um, he was indicted on murder of a man inside that club. And so when that happened, um, obviously, there's confusion. What's what do we do? What's going on here? There was a population of 21 in the year 2010, and then in the 2020 census, it comes out that there's zero people living here. And then an article comes out in the Dallas newspaper that Dallas Mavericks owner of the NBA, Mark Cuban, bought the property for two million dollars. And in the in the article, he said he did it to help a friend. So I don't know which friend that was. Uh, but he did it to help a friend and he had no plans for the future of the property. It's 77 acres and now Mark Cuban owns all this land. It's officially in, in the eyes of the Texas census, it's still a town and there's no one living here. What is Mark gonna plan to do? Is, is there gonna be any uh, future for the town of Mustang or is it just gonna become a ghost town and unincorporated community? So what did you think of that list? Obviously, uh, some different reasons compared to the other states I've done for towns becoming towns, but also some legit kind of ghost towns and some towns that just got smaller over time, uh, some that had history, and some with very strange history like Mustang here with the uh, owner of Mark Cuban. So uh, that, was a, that was a fun trip. I really enjoyed uh, going around the Lone Star State. It was a long trip. There was a lot of miles on this one, but a lot of interesting history here in Texas, and that was a lot of fun. This is what it's like driving through West Texas when it's 60 mile an hour wind. Oh my goodness, it is windy. Holy moly. And Thank you.
once you get out to the end here, it's just me and the birds. <laughs> it was a fishing lure that dropped off to freak me out. <laughs> My heart's racing a little bit. Lead me the way home. Just following you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs>